Hello. It's a hot summer down here in south of England. I don't know how it is where you are. And you know, today I'm wearing my Revive shirt, reminding me of that Revive that we so enjoyed. And even the weekend, though we couldn't go to Bashburnham ourselves, we loved it, didn't you? It was lovely to take part, being, uh, as it were, in our own sitting room or in our own garden. Wonderful. Well, you know, even in the darkest times, humour can help us. Uh, for example, I would tell you my favourite coronavirus joke, but it would take two weeks until you really got it. You know, and public announcements are different these days, aren't they? Have you noticed that? In challenging times, an airline pilot, for instance, is speaking to his passengers. Our cruising altitude today is 35,000 feet. The weather is set fair with just a possibility of light turbulence. So do keep an eye on the fasten seatbelt sign and enjoy the flight. In accordance with government guidelines, I'm working from home today. I think in these dark times, we all need that flash of light that a good joke provides. Did you know a good joke actually makes us laugh or groan, as my children would say, and that leads to endomorphine release in our brains that promotes a sense of calm and well-being. So there you are. I hope you feel calm and in well-being today. <clears throat> Well, what have we got to in the story? Hasn't it been exciting and wonderful? The way in which we've followed the story of Peter after that wonderful healing at the gate of the temple in Jerusalem. You know, we've heard some wonderful preaches in the past few Sundays, haven't we? And today we've reached a point in the story at the beginning of chapter 4 of Acts, which is where we are today, Acts chapter 4, verses 1 to 12, a dramatic moment in the story. Two things surprised me about the sermon that Peter preached. The first was the size of the response. Over 5,000 people responded to Peter's sermon. Isn't that wonderful? So I don't think we should be surprised when you think at Pentecost, a few days or weeks before, Peter had seen 3,000 people respond and be baptised and become followers of Jesus in, those, in, the, in, that, in that occasion. But the other thing that surprised me about the sermon was the reaction of the authorities. Verse 3 tells us that they were greatly disturbed by what Peter was teaching. And what was he teaching? In Jesus, the resurrection of the dead. Now, why did these authorities strongly disapprove of the idea of resurrection and disapprove strongly enough to send their temple police to arrest Peter and John and put them in prison? You see, for many people, in the Western world, in our materialistic value systems that have grown up over the past 200 years, many people laugh now at any talk of resurrection, whether of Jesus or of anyone else. In my lifetime, a bishop of the Church of England, for example, has gone on record and said that he did not believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. He called it a trick played with a bag of bones. So those of us who have persisted and stood out against this mockery and who say that we believe in the bodily, physical resurrection of Jesus are now considered conservatives <laughs> and not, rather than modern liberals. But you know, Paul says, and I'm quoting now from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless and you are still in your sins. What a terrible thing. So granted this, what made the authorities angry was not just that Peter announced that God had raised Jesus from the dead. He was preaching a much larger truth, that in Jesus, the resurrection out from the dead, to give it its expanded meaning from the Greek, 
The resurrection was a radical and dangerous teaching. It was a threat to those in power and a promise to those at the bottom of the heap. Resurrection, you see, is the belief that the living God is eventually going to put everything right once for all. He will restore all things and turn the world right way up at last. Peter was saying not only that Jesus himself had been raised from the dead, but that his resurrection is the start and sign of God's eventual restoration of all things. Think back to that prophetic song of Mary in Luke chapter 1, when she says, and I quote, For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation and generation after generation toward those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. That sums up prophetically the impact of the resurrection on the world. For Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, that Jesus had promised this healing Jesus had done through him at the temple gate was another sign that the new age had begun in the light of the resurrection of Jesus. And that age continues today and we live in the light of that resurrection and that hope that it builds, puts in our hearts, the hope that in the end God will eventually restore all things. Naturally, the temple authorities, the high priest and his family and the Sadducees, the aristocracy, the same court, in fact, that had put Jesus on trial, were now threatened by this teaching of Peter, one of his followers. They were the rulers who would be brought down from their thrones, those proud of their temple and its history. And remember, within a quarter of a century of Peter preaching, that the temple would be utterly destroyed in AD 70. Peter and John are now brought before this same court and are challenged. By what power or in what name have you done this? You remember even Jesus was challenged about the power and the name in which he healed the demonized. Some accused him of being healing in the power of Beelzebub, the devil. Peter gives a resounding no to this. He says this man has been made well by the name, the power, the presence of Jesus Christ the Nazarene. And then aware that of the men sitting in judgment on him are the same as those who passed sentence on Jesus, he adds, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead. It's in this name alone that this miracle has occurred. For good measure, Peter goes on to make two important statements about Jesus and his importance. And we'll focus on those two statements. The first is, He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. Now this is a quotation from Psalm 118, a beautiful psalm and a favourite psalm of the early church because it spoke prophetically about Jesus. It's a temple psalm, and it's a statement about Jesus being the chief cornerstone of a new temple, his body, the church. You know, when they were building magnificent buildings in those days, stones were prepared and often brought huge distances to be assembled and put together, and a misshapen stone would be discarded as unwanted and ignored. Just like Jesus described in Isaiah as despised and forsaken of men. This Jesus was the true Messiah who has now become the keystone that holds the whole building together. Jesus, our cornerstone, the one on whom we build. In in the other statement Peter makes is particularly unpopular in the Western world today. It's the statement that there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. 
Let me say that again. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. No other name but the name of Jesus. Before I close, then, I need to say something about this. Now, there's much I could say, but I will try to summarise briefly why it is such an important statement. Firstly, many people say this is arrogant, exclusive and triumphalist. What's so special about Jesus, they say? Why is he the only way someone can know God and be saved? Secondly, over the past 200 years, we have come to know of the depth and beauty of other great world religions. Surely, some would say, many say today, there are many paths that lead to the top of the mountain. Their way of saying that all religions should be taken at equal value and there's nothing unique about Jesus. Thirdly, of course, we have to admit that in the past, particularly in the history of colonial exploitation of other cultures, Europeans and especially the missionaries have, been, have used the name of Jesus to impose Christian values and a European way of life on other peoples. However, there are answers to these challenges. The first thing I would say is this. We as followers of Jesus of the Nazarene did not invent the idea of Jesus and his name, power and authority being the only way to eternal salvation. This is not our claim, but the claim of Jesus himself. When we say there is no salvation apart from faith in Jesus, we are simply asserting that Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And unless you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Secondly, the rest of the New Testament repeats this claim that Jesus and faith in his death and resurrection is the only way to peace with God. There is one God, says Paul, and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. And again, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. Thirdly, perhaps you are someone who thinks that we should be more tolerant and loving to our non-Christian friends. Well, when I think about other religions and other believers in other religions, I feel like Paul when he was thinking about the Jews who did not believe in Jesus. He says at the beginning of chapter 9 of Romans, I'm telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I wish, could wish, that I was a curse, separate from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. I don't claim that Jesus is the only way to salvation, as if that claim were some kind of weapon with which to beat others, but it's a testimony to my own experience of Jesus. Why is Jesus unique? Why do we claim the exclusive power of Jesus? Well, when it comes to life's big questions, who are you going to trust? The person with the best credentials. And I want to say to you, if you have doubts about it, that Jesus has the best credentials of all. The Gospels tell us that Jesus is the only one you can trust. Look again at something that Jesus said. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Who else on earth speaks like that? One who says, no one knows God the Father except me, that is Jesus. So Jesus teaches with 
unprecedented authority. Jesus led a blameless life. Jesus healed all manner of infirmities, it says. And finally, Jesus rose from the dead, the final evidence of his divine power and authority. My conclusion then about Jesus is, as it says in Philippians 2, God highly exalted him and it bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. So my challenge to you today is <clears throat> stay faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, many people have this sort of attitude to faith. Some, sometimes I've found this in people. They sort of hedge their bets. Oh, yes, I believe in Jesus, but I also believe, you know, and they have things at home, for example, that help them, they think, uh, on their journey of life. And I want to say to you, no, there is no other way. There is no other name but the name of Jesus by which we may be saved. Now, when it comes to other ways, you know, they're counterfeit. They're not the real thing. As someone once said, you never find a counterfeit nine pound note, do you? No, it's always very, very similar. It always is a tenner or a twenty or a five. And so it is, yes, there are counterfeits around and we need to be wise and we need, therefore, to guard ourselves from being fooled by these counterfeit religions. So don't be fooled by the counterfeits. Put your trust in Jesus Christ and him alone for your salvation. Amen. <laughs>